Hello, lords and ladies of the realm. It is I, Emily Sophia, aka M Mighty Sophia, here to break down for you guys the latest episode, getting close to the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones season six. We are on episode eight, which is entitled No One, or shall I say, An Episode Has No Name. So, Spoiler alert before I dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be endeavoring to bear all in this review. And what do you know, I am such a such a brilliant reviewer that I took some notes in my handy little leather bound book and thusly shall occasionally be looking down to reference my notes such that I make sure that I address everything that happened in the episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, this week's episode had, for me personally, a bit of a strange pace, but of course there were a lot of loose ends to tie up and threads to weave together before we enter into, enter, enter into <laughs> the great battle between the Starks and the Boltons. So... It makes sense that, that we would kind of hop around to the different places where we did, from River Run to Bravos, And of course, certain revelations occurred with Miss Arya Stark, indeed a girl who now has a name. And while I feel like it's possible they could have condensed things at River Run a wee bit such that we could spend more time with the showdown, throwdown between Arya and the Waif, I think it was really a cool choice how they chose uh, to represent that fight scene. And isn't it hilarious that all of the crazy theories that fans were spinning about who Arya actually is and who the Waif actually is and who jo Jochen was and none of that came to pass. <laughs> I mean, unless there's still even the remote possibility that there's something, something crazy that's going on. Um, in the backdrop. I think that everybody was generally who they were supposed to be. <laughs> so I guess we should have uh, taken things at face value, if you will. But I was very impressed to read all of the theories. And while I don't always do that with this show, because there have been so many and it's just so overwhelming after a while, I can, I could appreciate the way that people were looking into things and reading Arya's body language and looking into who was doing what and why and when. But now it looks like we've got a bit of resolution in that department. So let's start at the, at the very beginning. We begin the episode with Lady Crane, who is continuing to act in the very popular play as Cersei, and she delivers this very affecting performance you know you can see you can see people in the audience with tears in their eyes and it's really fascinating because while we get to see uh lady crane orating about getting revenge against sansa stark and against her brother the imp the real life cersei gets none of that <laughs> none of that sweet sweet revenge becomes hers in this episode so I really did appreciate that dramatic irony as we see the disconnect and the friction between this play-acted performance and Cersei's performance in, in real life. Um, very dissatisfying for her, and we'll get into that very soon. Um, but then, of course, at that point, we find, or uh, Lady Crane finds Arya backstage in the closet, bloodied up. Um, now, at this point, I was wondering, having read all the crazy theories, is that actually Arya? Like, is this, is this the waif who is go or, you know, like, I I'm thinking all of these crazy things, because it's like, okay, Lady Crane was on th the hit list, you know, so I thought to myself, well, okay, but it turned out to be Arya, so <laughs> shows, shows what we know. I think that we are just too dang smart for our own good, okay? Um, but anyways, so, um, Lady Crane seems like a generally cool lady. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bummed to see, uh, the fate that she ended up meeting as she was delivered to the many-faced god. Um, 
But yeah, she's talking to Arya. She's fixing her up and asks if she wants to join her play company as they are going to Pentos. Um, but Arya declines, saying, you know, I got a little somebody on my tail. And very soon we discover, well, yeah, it's the wife. And things get bloody and messy, but have a slightly happier ending than we might have anticipated. So, and she says that she wants to go all the way west to where the map stops. So is she going to actually do that? Or is she, where is she going to head at this point? Because as, for as much as I want her to join the rest of the Starks as they head up against the Boltons, it's like, maybe you shouldn't be there because it could be another bloodbath. I don't want to see, I, I, I do not know what to expect next week, but I'm very scared. And perhaps it's best that Arya remains in transit for a time. Um, she might be better off. Anyway, so we see that the Hound is on the warpath like a freaking juggernaut with his axe. And he takes out a bunch of dudes heckling each other and fingering each other's bungholes around a fire. Um, makes pretty quick work of them while he hunts down uh, the Brotherhood boys. Um, now we get to go back to Marine, which it's been a very long time since we were there because we spent a lot of time with Daenerys as she was, uh, you know, pretty much crowning herself a uh, queen of all the Dothraki and all that good jazz. So it's good to be back in Tyrion and Varys' midst. And we see that the uh, priestesses who of course worship the Lord of the Light, are preaching the virtues of Daenerys' reign and trying to make sure that everything is legit. Once again, a tenuous relationship um, between Daenerys' authority and a very different kind of power. And as to how all of that is going to con coincide, it remains yet to be seen. But we see that some other worshippers of the Lord of the Light are recognizing, you know, the winds that are awakening in the north. And so it'll be fascinating to see how all of these adherence to uh, the, what is the name, the Lord of the Light religion. <laughs> Why is that slipping my mind now? I feel like such an imbecile, but... Tell me in the comments and then I will apologize profusely. Um, but anyway, so it's interesting to see how all of these, you know, the the priests and priestesses are strategically located across Westeros and beyond. And it seems like they're kind of poised to play a big role in the war to come. That's what I'm seeing at this point. Um, but we also see that Varys is taking off. Um, just as soon as we get to go hang out with him again, he is leaving us. But I believe he said that he's headed to Westeros, correct? Because he needs to acquire resources and assets there. Once again, if I messed up on that one, tell me. Um, and Tyrion's kind of bummed to lose his buddy. But he gains a couple of new drinking buddies, so everything is awesome. But uh, meanwhile, things are not so awesome for Cersei back in King's Landing. Um, and we, we come to discover that the High Septon has formally requested Cersei's presence, to which she says he can come see me in the Red Keep if he wants to talk. And the Mountain is, of course, with her at that point. And, well... The Faith meet the Mountain <laughs> in a very bloody and brutal fashion, but unfortunately it looks like that's going to kind of be the extent of the action for the Mountain, at least for the foreseeable future, since uh, trial by combat has been done away with a little bit too late for a certain Oberyn Martell, but... King Tommen decides it's time to put his foot down now that the two pillars of of the the faith and the crown have come together. So <laughs> the very purpose for which the zombie mountain exists has been abolished, <laughs> and that's a problem for Cersei. I mean, there's another Lannister out there in the world who's trying to do good for for his house, but Ooh, things in the Lannister land are looking pretty grim, or at least for Cersei, anyway. Um, so, we continue on, of course, to River Run for the confrontation that everybody knew was coming, that being between Brienne and Jaime. So, first we see Brienne and Podrick heading on over, 
Um, and then Braun actually catches Pod off guard, and the two of them, you know, talk about the screw ability of Brian, which is an awkward experience for Podrick the Squire. And he tries to, you know, back her up and back himself up by saying that he's training to fight day and night. Um, to which Braun says, yo, you gotta work on the whole uh, being caught off guard thing. <laughs> and tries to impart a little bit of fighting wisdom to him while he's there. So it seems like like Tyrion and Braun are kind of the, the comedic relief here. You know, you got a little comedic relief down in Essos and a little comedic relief for Westeros. So... There you go. What more could you ask for? <laughs> but anyway, so we get to see Jamie and Brian come together and they talk about the Blackfish and the Tully army and everything that, that Brian is seeking to do. Um, and so she tries to propose a truce where essentially, you know, if she can get him, the Blackfish, to surrender the castle, then he and the rest of his crew can head north to aid in Sansa and company's cause. Um, and Jamie agrees to that on the surface, of course. Um, and then the two of them are kind of tripping over themselves as they're realizing that they may very well have to come to blows against one another. But at least when Brian actually tries to return Oathkeeper to Jamie, he gives it to her as a gift. So friendship reigns supreme, you know, in the places where you least expect it. And that is one little glimmering light of hope that we can cling on to. <laughs> and I have to say, I, I can feel it in my bones that the scene where Jamie is later waving farewell to Brienne, you know, like two ships passing in the night, he sees her down on the river rowing away with Podrick. I feel like that's a very meme-worthy moment, you know, just the like, the wave. <laughs> I don't know where that's going to come into effect or who's gonna be the one to make it popular, but I'm just saying, that, that kind of struck me as a very iconic <laughs> thing. Um, so anyways, good moments there. Um, now, the the Blackfish promptly resists Brienne as she tries to advocate for her cause. Um, and she does, she does everything she possibly can to convince him that this is a cause that's worth rallying his troops around. But he's very adamant about the fact that he wants to fight for his home and that's the last thing that he can do. You know, he was he was somebody who ran at the Red Wedding and he realizes that, yeah, death comes for everybody. I may as well have a blast as I'm going down, but I am not gonna leave my home again, not this time. So he sticks to his guns, Brian sticks to hers. Um, so even though he's given the opportunity to participate in the restoration of Winterfell to House Stark, it's not something that he can see himself getting behind. And it's and it's pretty sad to see how he loses control of River Run, but at the same time, you know, he is incredibly pragmatic and realistic and good humored. This guy would be a pleasure to have around for longer, but unfortunately, well, or fortunately, I suppose, he sees his fate and he meets it. He goes down swinging, which cannot be said for most men. Um, now, meanwhile, back in King's Landing, things continue to go on a downward spiral for Cersei, as she is not only kicked out of the throne room and sent to the gallery, um, but from there she comes to discover that her son is abolishing the very tradition that she has been freaking banking on, so she only gets to spill just a teeny tiny little drop of blood. You know, just enough to fill up a couple of her beloved wine goblets and, well, really no more. <laughs> so that that registers to her as as a shock. Um, and certainly robs her of the opportunity to get justice the way that she wants. And so instead, it is announced that her trial and Loris's trial, well, both of their, the dates are given, and she now knows that they're going to stand to trial before the Seven Septons, just like the good old days. So for as much as I, you know, from... 
a moral ethical standpoint agree with King Tommen's um, proposal and decree. I totally get that. And again, it's like this came a little bit too late <laughs> for, for uh, at least one fan favorite. But sorry, Cersei, it sucks to be you. But I guess that's what happens when you try to you know, exploit a violent tradition for your own purposes. It will suddenly disappear and you don't get to do anything with it anymore, so... <laughs> wah, wah. Um, but anyways, anyways, then, um, apparently there is a rumor that a few little birds have been investigating, and, uh, since that scene um, in the throne room immediately cuts to stuff with Tyrion, I feel like the little birds must have discovered something about what Tyrion is doing in Marine, right? I mean, that it stands to reason, so let me know if you think it's about something different, and I totally missed a major context clue, but anyways... We get, now we get to one of my favorite parts of the episode, <laughs> of course, right before the slavers show up to wage war, Tyrion decides that it's time to celebrate, you know? He's looking at this, this uneasy peace that has been established. He's very proud of himself, patting himself on the back, having a little drink, and Grey Worm and Masande continue to watch in a complete daze as this man prances about, insisting that they tell stories and jokes and, um, you know, he does finally get to teach those two about the joys of fermentation. And it is so freaking adorable. I could watch an entire spin-off series of <laughs> of the imp and Grey Worm and Masande trying to learn the ins and outs of humor and alcohol. <laughs> I could get behind that. You know, maybe a bonus episode, since the next couple of seasons are going to be shorter. Can we just get a little, you know, <laughs> a little mini episode of the three of them just cracking wise? And, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Um, and then Tyrion even talks about his dream of having his own vineyard and uh, making the imp's delight, which he would only share with his closest confidants. <laughs> And now, of course, he, after he tells a joke about Westeros, one that doesn't really resonate with his now drinking audience, um, he gets Masande to tell a little funny, and it's a pretty dang good one. The joke about the two translators and uh, the sinking ship and the ones like, oh, I can cry for help in 19 different languages. I gave that one a chuckle. And then Grey Worm is just, he is the ultimate deadpan devil. Like, he immediately follows that up with his own joke, which totally goes over both Tyrion and Masande's head. And uh, it was just, it was just so brilliant. So much joy. I, I love it. I love it. I could listen to the three of them go on forever and ever. They are the, the ultimate trifecta of um, charmingness. But yeah, so things are interrupted pretty rudely, pretty quickly, okay? And at first I was thinking, it was like, wait, are the Greyjoys showing up already? Because they're headed to try and find Daenerys as well. And I don't think that Euron Greyjoy has his fleet of a thousand ships yet, but it's the slaver's turn to show up. And, uh, hey, Danny comes just in time, too, so it's gonna be a true party now, because, uh, well, she's got a dragon with her, okay? So, clearly things are, the odds are possibly, probably, definitely in their favor, I'm thinking. Now, we go back to River Run really quick, um, and there's this whole scene between, uh, Edmure Tully and, and Jamie as they talk about their sister issues, and essentially what I, what that conversation boils down to is, you know, the things we do for love, which is a quote from the very first season, okay? And it is one that has forever made me associate the uh, 10cc song, The Things We Do For Love, with this show. So that was, that was a pretty fun, subtle little callback. But yeah, Jamie underscores the fact that all of this, what he is doing here, is about getting back to Cersei, and that's what taking River Run is for him. Um, 
So after that point, Edmure is forced to go along with Jamie's plan and things go down relatively bloodlessly. Now, an interesting thing about this episode is that two major skirmishes happen off screen. We don't get to see the death of, of the Blackfish. Um, and we also don't get to see the death of the Waif either. So I don't really know what to what to make of that and why those two things were totally circumvented. Maybe it's because there's going to be a lot of death next week and they're trying to just kind of clear the playing field, you know, make sure that they don't have to do too much of a cleanup on aisle five um, as next Sunday rolls around. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think about that? that choice to avoid showing the deaths of these two pretty prominent characters, you know, even though their circumstances are totally different. I just kind of thought about that, kind of puzzled. Um, but anyways, so B the Blackfish is almost given the opportunity to redeem himself by joining Brian and Podrick and going to help at Winterfell, but the Blackfish is like, you know what? You guys got this down. <laughs> so <laughs> their whole mission was, it was not pointless by any stretch of the imagination. The results are certainly different and um, their inability to get extra fighting men, of course, is going to make the odds uh, of winning for the Starks quite a bit slimmer. But therein lies the excitement and the anxiety. So. And then, you know, uh, Jamie hopes to get a final final little showdown with the, the Blackfish. And I think that he wants to gloat. You know, he's trying to... It's like the question that Edmure posed earlier. Like, how do you live with yourself? How do you convince yourself that you're a decent person, you know? And I think that for, for Jamie, he's trying to focus on the success of taking back the castle and the implications of of that for his relationship with Cersei and all this stuff and feeding into his ego, yada, yada, yada. But then the Blackfish is dead. So he is completely robbed of, of the joy of his victory, which I think foretells certain unpleasantries to come um, if and when he gets back to King's Landing to try and deal with things along with Cersei. So maybe that's, that's kind of a thing to consider when we think about why we didn't see the death of the Blackfish. But anyways, so... Now, yeah, Danny shows up. It looks like the Hound is actually going to be joining the Brotherhood without banners after all. And uh, we get a very fun scene where he co-ops an execution. <laughs> um, well, you know, of the same Brotherhood guys who took out the villagers and his good friend and all that jazz. Um, now, of course, Mr. Uh, Patchy the Pirate Guy uh, Beric Dondarian? I do not remember how to pronounce that and probably botched it, but... So he is from, like, the first in the third seasons, I think. He leads the Brotherhood without banners. He was resurrected and all that good jazz and came after Sandor back in the day. So it's kind of cool to see them come back together and, um, the Hound is given a new lease on life. But, yeah, this... There was definitely a lot of humor this week, I have to say. That was probably my favorite aspect of this chapter, and it's one that I'm going to have to cling on to as we brace ourselves for what is going to be an incredible episode next week. But, whoo, daddy, it's, it's going to be something else. So now this, of course, leads me to the showdown between Arya and the Waif, which is a lot more straightforward than a lot of people were speculating. But nonetheless, I think it went down in a very cool way. Um, so we find that Lady Crane is violently killed by the Waif. You know, the many-faced god was promised a name and now another name. <laughs> so I am, I'm trying to break down the logistics of, of what happened here. And I would, I would love to know your guys' thoughts about this. Um, but yeah, so Arya runs like mad, makes a crazy break for it. Super impressive considering the state of her intestinal and stomach related affairs. Um, and uh, yeah, she she takes a really bad fall down some stairs and over some fruit baskets. Ends up leaving a bloody trail for the waif to find. Um, but then... Uh, 
And I now I think it's she was she was um, leading her uh, Arya was leading the way purposefully I think on on a trail such that she could get to where she had stowed needle and then she would get the upper hand which is very clear and it's it's cool to see how she literally cut the lights uh, with <laughs> with needle um, now when she goes back to the house of black and white there's a super interesting scene be her, between her and uh, Jockin and now he sees he sees the trail of of blood in the house and then the blood that's dripping down from the face of which I believe that was the face of the waif, correct? Now, if I'm wrong, was that the face of Lady Crane? See, again, this might be a totally stupid question, but um, when when Jochen smiled, I was very surprised because, you know, he says finally that a, a girl finally has no name. But Arya discovers the truth about herself and, and affirms that, saying a girl has a name, and that name is Arya Stark. And by the way, I, pronoun I, am going home. <laughs> and he's totally par for the course with that. So was the waif's death what the many-faced god wanted? And now another thing that I was thinking, too, um... Is it the fact that the that the waif trying to kill Arya was that a personal kill? And so would that have labeled her for death anyway? Again, there are so many cool little nuances and intricacies about the way that these things went down. And my perspective is by no means comprehensive. So I would love to know your thoughts and analyses and if I misconstrued something please inform me of your thoughts as well. So that about does it for me this week, but penultimate episode, episode nine, The Real Clincher is coming next week. And I will be continuing to review AMC's The Preacher. And I also started watching iZombie as well. So I'm expanding my world, y'all. But hey, you guys take care of yourselves. Anything I missed, bring it up in the comments. And as always, I'll be back before you know it.